Fu Ronghuan is an uh, assistant professor of the Department of Computer Science and University of Maryland. She works on statistical, <coughs> statistical and trustworthy machine learning, reinforcement learning, graph neural networks, deep learning theory, and federated learning with specialization in domain adaptation, algorithmic uh, robustness, and fairness. And Furo is a recipient of the NSF CR2 uh, award and some other prestigious awards. And uh, she received her PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from UC Irvine. And she also had a postdoc with our Microsoft research in New York City. I also like to express our special thanks to Furon since uh, this is uh, during her thanks we uh, Thanksgiving weekend. It's like Chinese uh, Spring Festival. Thank you for spending a, a holiday weekend with us. So go ahead, Furon. It's my pleasure. Uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you for the organizers for inviting me to this very wonderful event. Very happy to see a lot of uh, very interesting talks. I hope everyone can see my screen now. Uh, please let me know if not. So yes, I'll be talking. Yes, uh, it's, uh, it's fine. Both your screen okay. and uh, your video. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you again for inviting me. Uh, so I'm going to talk about efficient machine learning at the edge in parallel. To echo the theme of this workshop, we'll be talking about optimization specifically, you know, data-driven optimization, but with the, uh, you know, like the bridge of machine learning here. So since I work on machine learning, I also work on, you know, non-convex optimization. So I hope I can introduce some of our recent work in efficient machine learning uh, to the audience. So I wanted to start by motivating this kind of uh, real-time machine augmented intelligence. So we kind of live in the uh, you know, era of information deluge. Uh, even the smartest can be overwhelmed by the highly dynamic and massive data streams we have to keep up with in order to make informed decisions, right? Whether, uh, for example, is our everyday life of driving at a very busy traffic junction or it is, you know, a high priority task of um, healthcare and medicine, uh, or even in a very extreme case, command and control in a battle space. So in all these kind of very complicated situations, we really need machine learning to deal with the massive data streams and to augment intelligence for efficient decision making. And today I'll be focusing on efficiency, as I mentioned before, but the challenges in decision making, especially concerns efficiency, is the low learning efficiency. What do I mean by that? Usually what I mean is like, you know, the prevalent machine learning models these days are deep learning models. And training such deep learning decision makers take tons of samples and computations as well. This is not news to any one of us, I guess, in the audience. So you can see the amount of data needed in order to get very high performance essentially is growing really um, drastically in terms of, you know, the, uh, especially when it comes to the industry giants, right? People are, uh, you know, uh, big companies, for example, like Microsoft uh, is able to have a lot of uh, data uh, to fit into the decision makers to achieve their high performance. Uh, but there is a quality gap in AI products in terms of, you know, the amount of data you have. And the second challenge I, I wanted to talk about today in uh, decision making is the low model efficiency. So um, everyone uh, in this audience, I guess, is aware that uh, we have larger and larger models these days, and people actually call those models foundational models. These foundational models are uh, indeed achieving a lot of state-of-the-art performances in a lot of tasks. Uh, for example, computer vision tasks, all sorts of computer vision tasks, natural language tasks as well. And these days, even for medical uh, imaging and so on, these foundational models are really, um, you know, achieving the state of the art performance. But the problem is that models are getting wider and deeper, right? So therefore, the very low model efficiency prohibits us, for example, from academia to pursue this very high uh, profile or large models because we simply don't have the computation power um, to train such large models. So, um, so what I wanted to talk about today is uh, the theme of learning to scale. 
Specifically, I will be talking about model efficiency, data efficiency, as well as paradigm efficiency. I'll first start with the model efficiency and data efficiency here. So I wanted to start by saying that, you know, uh, everyone knows that in machine learning, there is the very popular, um, you know, uh, prevalent operations, especially for imaging data, is the convolution, right? So uh, people know that convolutional neural networks has achieved tremendous success, but convolutions are also very expensive, especially if you think about, you know, very large images and the compositions of convolution operations throughout a very deep neural network, it is very uh, parameter expensive, right? So I wanted to think about the question of, can we make the models more efficient through some kind of network design, specifically some design of the convolutional operation, and maybe also introduce some interpretability to the operations. So now what we really did is, you know, consider this operation of the convolution. So convolution is indeed, if you think about it, it's like an input uh, tensor is going to be a three order tensor, or you can think about it, the three dimensional array is an input tensor, which has like, you know, the width and the depth of the image, as well as number of channels of the image, for example, RGB channels. So it's going to be a three dimensional uh, tensor, but this three dimensional tensor will have to be convolved with a, a convolution kernel. And this convolution kernel is actually a fourth dimensional uh, tensor, right? So a four dimensional array. Uh, it is, you know, uh, the the um, dimension of the kernel size as well as the input channel and output channel. So that makes the, com you know, the model really complex. Um, so what we did in our very recent research um, is to, um, rather than, you know, using this linear operation, we introduced some multilinear operation. And indeed, using this multilinear operation, we're going to factorize um, um, the tensor of the kernel, the fourth dimensional, the four dimensional array will be first mapped into an even higher dimensional array. And then we're going to do a factorized form of this very high dimensional tensors uh, and then design our neural network based on this very high dimensional multi -oper multi linear operations. And very um, surprisingly, we'll see that the model become really uh, small when you do such operation. So basically, we're able to achieve model compression using this tensor representation. And specifically, we can also prove that there is an improvement in terms of the generalization, which is the key problem really, we really want for neural networks. Because, you know, neural networks is trained using some data, but we really hope that it can generalize to unseen data. So we kind of prove that there is a generalization improvement through the lens of the compression. And uh, this is really useful if you consider personalized machine learning. And in these days, you know, federated learning in edge devices such as your smartphones. And indeed, I'm going to talk about federated learning in a second. Um, so not in a second, <laughs> in a few minutes. Um, so what we did is we're trying to show that in this kind of tensor uh, inspired so-called tensor neural network, we're able to prove that with the same number of parameters, there is a guaranteed expressive, Im expressive power improvement, which is really nice. And also empirically, you can observe that in the uh, original neural network, for example, the blue line, you don't see this kind of low rankness in all the layers. But very surprisingly, once you do this kind of train this tensor inspired, tensor factorized formed inspired neural network, it becomes really low rank, as you can see in the orange line. So this observation is actually proven through our theorem. We'll kind of give a generalization error bound to show that this compressed neural network has a very good generalization guarantee. OK, so um, so after that, we also kind of extend this kind of understanding of a convolutional neural network to this very um, popular model, so-called transformers. I guess many of us have heard about transformers, and the key component of a transformer is this multi-head self-attention, right? So, and transformers have been achieving very tremendous success in a lot of applications, basically, you know, achieving all the state of the art in natural language processing, you know, 
um, uh, uh, in also um, you know com computer vision tasks. So what we did also using this tensor inspired operation, we're we're trying to give a rigorous visual interpretation of self attention, and it turns out if we look at the tensor diagrams of these um, uh, transformers, you can see a single head attention and a multi head attention are indeed not just a simple parallelism, right? So people always think that, you know, multi head is just a parallelism of a single head uh, self attention, but it turns out if you really rigorously write the mathematical uh, interpretation of the self attention, it is not, it is more than that. So based on this observation, we designed a new architecture based on the transformer. So is a guaranteed to have a higher expressive power under the same size as the transformer. So indeed, this is a plug and play kind of module. So you can uh, you know, replace this part in all the transformers. And indeed, we achieve very impressive uh, empirical results uh, by designing this tunable hat self-attention. So I wanted to show you very briefly some empirical results in a very challenging long-term video prediction uh, where we're trying to predict the future based on the spiral, uh, sp a spatial temporal correlation. You can see that we're achieving a very good result as uh, this is ours. We're basically achieving the highest performance with fewest parameters, which is very impressive. Um, and even for the more uh, you know, commonly used image classification task, you can see on the CIFAR 10 uh, you know, benchmark data set, which is widely used in the computer vision uh, community, uh, we use a ResNet32 deep neural network, which has 460K parameters. Originally with this 460K parameters, uh, they achieved 93% accuracy, but now using our kind of tensor neural network, uh, you know, with 10%, uh, you kind of achieve a very small degradation of the performance. Uh, so you can kind of see that you can still maintain pretty high performance with very small models. So uh, not only that, we also consider uh, data that has a little bit of a special structure, for example, uh, graph data. Right? So graph data has been really uh, useful in social networks as well as uh, in the molecular understanding, you know, new material uh, identification and so on. So we wanted to understand whether we're able to learn, uh, you know, um, uh, these kind of very big graph data efficiently. And it turns out, you know, we had a recent, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, finding saying that, yes, we can indeed design a universal framework to scale up any graph neural networks using vector quantization. And vector quantization is indeed a very, uh, you know, simple uh, idea of just, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, aggregate the nodes with similar properties and uh, map them into code books, right? So, and the code words in the code books are going to be like, you know, the representatives of uh, the properties of the nodes. And through that uh, nice representation, we're able to scale up any graph neural networks without compromising the performance. There is actually a theoretical guarantee about that. Uh, and in, a, in the extension to that, also uh, recently in this year's NeurIPS, which is gonna happen in, uh, in a week. So we also proposed a method called SketchGNN, which is a sublinear complexity training framework uh, by using a polynomial tensor sketch theory. So what's really nice about this work is that we're able to sketch some nonlinear activations to really speed up this thing. In addition, we'll also, of course, speed up uh, the calculation of the graph convolution matrices by sketching them uh, into much lower dimensions. But I think the nonlinear activation sketching is a really novelty here using the polynomial tensor sketch theory. So, um, so I talked about model efficiency. Now, in terms of the data efficiency, we've also done something I think is really interesting. So we know that in machine learning models, uh, a lot of us know that data augmentation is a very important technique, although people do not necessarily realize it. But in order to make machine learning work in a lot of uh, you know, these uh, tasks, data augmentation is the key oftentimes. 
So we want to understand why data augmentation is so important. And we wanted to get a theoretical understanding of the model invariances that are induced from introducing these data augmentations. So data augmentation, for example, in images are usually like, you know, rotations of the images data uh, or color gittering or, you know, kind of cropping or uh, uh, flipping of the images and so on. So it's some kind of a transformation of the data. Well, then, uh, you know, it turns out in our recent work, we study the generalization benefits of the model invariances uh, introduced by this kind of uh, data augmentation. So what we did was we introduced the sample cover uh, induced by data augmentation. What it means is that we're kind of looking at like, you know, the distance of the data, not from the original space, but after the transformation. In a sense, we kind of look at like a covering number, we call it sample cover, right, which is very related to like the, you know, the VC dimension kind of complexity uh, theory. So we kind of introduce the sample cover to understand, you know, how complex the sample is and then can help us uh, understand the generalization benefits of this model invariances by introducing this data augmentation. So, um, but uh, uh, lastly, I wanted to introduce uh, the third part of this talk here, which is an efficient learning paradigm in this kind of uh, decision making. So what I really wanted to focus is like, I think models are learned in a central controller sequentially, and this is what's what I mean here. So at time t, you have a uh, you know image, and uh, you know you kind of uh, use the label of the image to backpropagate to you know kind of update the model, and then you go to a next time stage, you see another image, and you do a backpropagation and do that again and again and again uh, uh, iteratively, right? So, but this is not really efficient. And indeed, I wanted to argue that this, you know, sequential nature, although you can do kind of aggregation of the data, is not very scalable. And today's theme is to, you know, uh, learning to scale. So I wanted to introduce a more efficient paradigm, which is the federated learning paradigm. So I called it first. I wanted to introduce the centralized federated learning, um, which essentially is a central server that is trying to do the computation, collect things from feedbacks from all the clients, for example, different hospitals or, you know, the clients that may have their private data that they don't want to share with the central controller. So, but there were some challenges in this centralized federated learning, although a lot of people have made very, uh, you know, uh, very nice progresses in this area, but there were some limited scalabilities here. For example, the most prominent one is the centralized host becomes a single point of failure. If you consider, you know, the central server breaks down, then the entire system breaks down, right? This is a big concern here. You have to make sure that the central server is really safe in order for the system to work. And then there is also the concern of the data privacy breaches. Indeed, there is a lot of researchers that are uh, trying to, uh, you know, show that centralized federated learning is not private, right? Your data is not private through this federated learning. And um, there is also a concern about high communication latency because everyone has to talk to the central controller, which makes the central controller has a lot of burden in terms of communication. So with this concern, I wanted to think about this question of what if we don't have the central host? What if, what if we only, you know, do a peer-to-peer -peer communication? Can we do that? And it turns out this becomes a decentralized federal learning. You can remove the single point of failure for sure, and you can also improve the data privacy because you're not going to exchange your model or exchange your uh, gradient with everyone. You're only going to exchange it to your neighbor, okay? So, um, but there is a concern. So are we able to use decentralized federal learning to lower communication latency? Because you're still a, have to communicate with all your neighbors, right? So in that sense, we're not sure whether you're able to, um, you know, reduce the communication latency. More importantly, it's not clear whether you allow asynchronous update and whether this asynchronous update would lead to convergence. So. Um, summarize, in the challenges in decentralized federated learning is constructing efficient communication protocol amongst clients. 
Uh, there is also a challenge of ensuring the convergence of a global model under asynchronous updates. And, you know, dealing with changing and sparse network topology is another challenge. And of course, being robust to deal with non-IID data between heterogeneous clients. By non-IID, I just mean data distribution shift. So it is also another concern here. So we wanted to understand all these concerns. And with that, we introduced the shared weight-free transmission federated learning. We call it SWIFT. So SWIFT is really nice. It actually, this is a um, you know cartoon about a SWIFT with four clients, of course. Uh, but you know you can imagine the scales to many clients freely uh, because it's a really scalable algorithm. It actually um, is asynchronous in the sense that it doesn't care whether your clients are slow or whether clients are fast. It's always going to be very, very uh, you know kind of uh, adaptive in terms of heterogeneous in the clients. And it's also weight free in the sense that you don't have to wait. Uh, for communication delay, right? So whenever you need to fetch something, you just fetch it. Uh, and whenever you have a update, you just kind of put that update in a mail. You can imagine you have a mailbox in front of your house. You just put your update there in that mailbox. And whenever people come to your house to do a fetching, uh, you know, the clients just fetch from your mailbox. Okay, so that's why it's asynchronous and weight free and also achieve state-of-the-art communication time complexity. Not only that, also it does not require a bound on the speed of the lowest client in the network, which is not very usual in this kind of asynchronous algorithms. Um, and also it achieves the golden standard iteration convergence rate of parallel SGD. So um, with that, I just wanted to show you some empirical results. Uh, we have a state-of-the-art convergence efficiency. You can see compare with all the state-of-the-art, uh, you know, asynchronous algorithms in federated learning, we get the best convergence efficiency. Not only that, we also get the most efficient communication. Um, and of course, we're also showing that we get a state-of-the-art adaptability to heterogeneous data across clients. And I think I'm going to stop. Here, this is just a summarization of uh, what I talked today. I talked about recent progress in my group about efficient machine learning in parallel. Specifically, I talked about model efficiency, data efficiency, as well as paradigm efficiency. But overall, I also wanted to give you guys a very brief introduction about what I do in general. I work on trustworthy decision making using machine learning, and I care about robustness specifically you know, generalizability, distributional robustness, and adversarial robustness. I also care about efficiency, and that's like the major topic we talked about today. And in addition to that, I also care a lot about ethics, for example, data privacy and uh, fairness, algorithmic fair fairness. So uh, I would like to thank uh, all my students. Without them, none of these can be possible. And finally, this is a list of related work um, and also some other related works. Thank you. Thank you uh, for, for the nice talk on her uh, to share her latest research on machine learning, especially focusing on efficiency and scalability issues in the state of the art uh, deep learning uh, models. So any questions from the audience? Uh, I saw a question from Zhang Shizhuo. Uh, perhaps you can turn on your camera and uh, mic yeah. to ask the direction of uh, the question. Um, thank, thank, thank you, thank you, Professor Furu. I'm Zhang Shizhuo, and uh, I'm very interested in your uh, talking. And uh, I think uh, several months ago, I have coding a project named Guru N N. Um, I'm guessing the bionic neurons can damage grow when the neurons is tired and ask the stem cells to grow it. So I'm coding this as the activity level, such as if an activity function output value that is bigger than 0 0.8 and it will grow the same 
cells, but uh, the half of its parameters. And uh, I, I here you, you, you are also co you are also proposed the neural network that is scalable. Uh, so I'm not very quite understand about your your math. Uh, thank you. I see. Uh, so yeah, I I think I understand what your question is. You're basically asking, you know, how does my method compare with this dynamic growing network design? Essentially, you know, when you're doing training, you're kind of dynamically growing the neurons based on your results. I think that's a very really good question. Uh, so what we did here, what I introduced specifically for model efficiency, is as if like you know you are trying to represent the network in a new form or introduce a new kind of operation. For example, you know rather than doing this linear operation, you do the multilinear operation. But what you did is more like you know dynamically growing the number of neurons in the network. Uh, you know, from my understanding, I think they, these are complementary. They were not in conflict with each other or anything. So you could also imagine that using this kind of newly designed operations, it could also be, you know, uh, combined with this dynamic growing of the network. Um, I haven't tried that, but I think that's an interesting direction to explore. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for the question. Uh, there is uh, another people from the audience raising the hand. Uh, Hao Liao, can you uh, turn on your mic and ask questions? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the Professor Huang's uh, great talk. I'm very interested in this uh, machine learning for the decision making because uh, we, uh, I also heard some uh, some people from the management domain also make uh, this decision making is a mainstream to in this uh, AI area. Uh, from my uh, for the question, uh, I would like to ask is that uh, what's uh, what's uh, your uh, idea about this decision making uh, in uh, from the AI model and uh, uh, the difference between the human. Uh, decision making because this is some kind of a conflict uh, is uh, robust mm -hmm. and efficient. So mm -hmm. I would like to ask this question. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's a great question. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Uh, first, I want to say that today I didn't introduce the interactive decision making where what decision you make is going to affect the future. So, um, you know, I actually work on interactive decision making, but for decision making in general, I think uh, human in the loop is kind of very important in a sense that, you know, uh, in my vision, I think uh, you should let AI do the heavy lifting computing um, and storage and so on, but maybe let the human to teach the AI something. So, for example, you can imagine like this data augmentation thing. So, you know, people choose to, you know, uh, change the color of the image or um, you know, do a cropping of the image and then fit it to the model. You know, if you think about it, this is as if like human in the loop, you know, because humans know that such kind of data transformation is not going to change the label of the image. This is still going to be an image of the cat, even if it is flipped, right? So it's like this kind of human information is infused into the model so that, you know, it's kind of like a, you know, collaboration between the human and the machine. So in my mind, I think in a lot of cases, uh, maybe we should have a human in the loop, but we need to be very careful about how to involve the human in the loop. Uh, I think, for example, explainability could be having human in the loop in some sense, right? And then robustness should be, uh, you know, maybe you could also imagine, uh, you know, adversarial robustness could be uh, achieved even better with the human in the loop. Actually, I know some of the recent work people do is like, you know, when they have an autonomous driving vehicle, of course, there is a safe RL problem that is intrinsic in it. But maybe you can have a human to kind of intervene when there is a critical situation, right? For example, you know, you know, human in the uh, autonomous vehicle try to uh, adjust such very uh, safety critical things. And then the human, uh, sorry, the machines can learn from such adjustments, 
in that sense, you know, you're kind of collecting the data for the machines using the human. Um, so yeah, I think human in the loop and uh, machine um, autonomous decision making should be somehow combined organically. <laughs> okay, thank you for your great answer. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, allow me to ask a final quick question. So for the federated learning part, you said uh, one motivation is because uh, it avoids single point of failure, right? Actually, in my previous incarnation, I'm working on fault tolerant distributed computing. And so I'd like to follow up that uh, in your current scheme, can you also tolerate uh, component failure, like uh, some part of the your machines failed and others can uh, I think, take over yeah, the job? That's a that's a great point. I think, you know, when I talk about a single point of failure, I didn't mention that, you know, you might just do have a redundancy in the server itself or, you know, having copies and, you know, this fault tolerant approaches. But I don't think it's conflicting what we're proposing here. So in mm -hmm. here, we're trying to propose a decentralized federal learning so that people only like talk to their neighbors. Uh, the theorem says that you don't, uh, you still achieve convergence if you have failed agents, for example, for those failed failed clients, you basically uh, just, you know, kind of think about they have like a very uh, large delay uh, in that sense, because we don't have a bound. Our theorem don't have a bound on the speed of the slowest client, so we can deal with that situation. Um, okay. But in practice, I think uh, you could also imagine this fault tolerant approaches implemented to all the clients in some sense to make the overall system more resilient. Thank you. Let's uh, thanks again for Furu for her sure. nice talk.